Between 1603 and 1868, Japan was almost entirely isolated from the rest of the world. For over 200 years, the shogunate not only cut off diplomatic ties with other countries, but they banned any foreigners from entering, and Japanese people were forbidden to leave. But a lot happened in those 200 years, like the invention of calculus in the 1660s. That meant that Japanese mathematicians had no knowledge of things like derivatives or differentials, and instead, they built out their own mathematical system completely independent from the math being done in the West. For example, instead of using integrals to calculate the area under a curve, they used a system called ENDI, which accomplished the same goal by calculating the areas of ever-shrinking circles. But even in complete isolation, these Japanese mathematicians made discoveries that paralleled or even preceded their Western counterparts. To illustrate that, let's look at how we calculate the sums of integers. Now say you wanted to find the sum of all of the integers up to maybe a thousand. You could sit and add one plus two plus three plus four and so on. It would take a really long time, but it would be possible. But now imagine you were trying to add the squares of all the integers. After about 13 or so, it would start to get pretty hard. And what about the cubes? Luckily for us, the ancient Greeks like Pythagoras and Archimedes already gave us a convenient formula for calculating the integers and their squares and their cubes. In the early 17th century, Johann Faulhaber figured out formulas for the fourth power and the fifth all the way up to the 17th, but he couldn't find any generalized formula for calculating all the exponents. Not until Jacob Bernoulli discovered a pattern in those formulas which led to the discovery of a series of constants that allowed us to calculate the sum of integers for any power. These were published posthumously in his book Ars Conjectandi in 1713. But across the world, the exact same sequence was discovered by the Japanese mathematician Seki Takakazu in his book Katsuyo Sampo, which was also published posthumously in 1712 one year before Bernoulli. These Bernoulli numbers are one of the most important discoveries in mathematics. They appear in the Taylor sequence, the Riemann zeta function, and the euler maclaurin summation. But they were discovered completely independently in Japan at nearly the same time. Unlike calculus in the West, which was used for practical applications like figuring out compound interest, Japanese mathematics was largely recreational or perhaps even spiritual. One of the most common places that you would encounter Japanese mathematics was in Shinto shrines, where complex problems were written on wooden tablets and hung for everyone to see. These sangaku, as they were called, were presented as an offering to the gods and also as a challenge to other visitors. There were even some people, like Yamaguchi Kanzan, who made a pilgrimage around the country for over 10 years, recording more than 350 of these in his travel diary. One of the problems that he recorded wasn't solved until 2018, almost 200 years after it was originally written. But rather than just talk about these sangaku, maybe we should try one. Here's a puzzle from the Sachimiya Shrine in Gunma Prefecture from about 200 years ago. In this problem, there are three mutually tangent circles, which means all three are touching, but not intersecting. All three circles are also sitting on a common tangent line. If we know the radii of two of these circles, how can we calculate the radius of the remaining circle? Well, we could use Descartes' theorem and try to figure it out that way, but the Japanese didn't have that, so neither will we. They did, however, have the Pythagorean theorem, so maybe we can still work this out the long way. We'll start by making a line from the halfway point of the pink circle to the halfway point of the green circle, and we'll label this line with a length of x. We'll do the same thing on the other side, from the halfway point of the green circle to the halfway point of the blue circle, and we'll label this one y. Now to use Pythagorean theorem, we need some right triangles. So first, we'll draw a perpendicular line from our x line to the center of the pink one. If you look carefully, you can see that this is equal to the radius of the pink circle minus the radius of the green circle. 
so we'll call it R1 minus R. Now we'll connect the center of the pink circle and the center of the green circle to get our hypotenuse. You can see that this line is equal to the radius of the pink circle plus the radius of the green circle. So we'll call this one R1 plus R. We can make a similar triangle on the other side with a perpendicular line that's equal to R2 minus R and our hypotenuse R2 plus R. We need one more triangle to figure this out. So we'll start by connecting the center of the pink circle and the center of the blue circle. Remember, this is equal to the radius of the pink plus the radius of the blue, so we'll call it R1 plus R2. The base of our triangle is just X plus Y. And the adjacent side is equal to the radius of the blue minus the radius of the pink, so we'll call that one R2 minus R1. Now we're ready to start plugging these terms into the Pythagorean theorem. The square of our base, x, plus the square of the adjacent side, r1 minus r, is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, r1 plus r. We can do the same formula for our orange triangle on the right and for our yellow triangle. Now the first thing we'll probably want to do is to factor these out to make them a little bit easier to work with, and that looks like this. Next, we want to take the square root of both sides so that we can get rid of those exponents. Now we have a value for x and for y, so we can plug those in to the third equation like this. If we simplify this one more time, we get an equation that can solve for radius r. Well, we already know the radii of r1 and r2, so if we plug those values in here, we can see that 9 times 36 over the sum of the square root of 9 plus the square root of 36 squared will give us our r value. Well, 9 times 36 is 324. The square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of 36 is 6, and all of that squared is equal to 81, which means that our radius for the green circle is equal to 4. Not bad. These Sangaku encapsulate everything that I love about mathematics. For one, they seem to have been made purely for the joy of solving them. Let's look at this ukiyo-e painting from 1848. If you look in the top right corner, you can see kids solving problems on a soroban, or a Japanese abacus. They're doing this mathematics purely for the joy of it. One of the big complaints that people have when they're learning math in school is, when am I ever going to use this? And that, to me, shows something fundamentally wrong with math education. Math should be like music. You don't have to understand all of the theory to enjoy the beauty of it. There's so much more to math than just memorizing formulas. But even more than all of that, this Japanese mathematics shows the universal nature of math. Despite being completely isolated from the rest of the world for over 200 years, Japanese scholars made the same discoveries about mathematical principles as their counterparts in Europe and the Middle East. Because math is the language of nature, and whether you're in Japan or on the surface of Mars, these rules still hold true. There's something really comforting about that to me.